Good morning. Welcome to the fifth annual Vivian Penn Symposium. I'm Janine Clayton, and I'm delighted to be here to welcome you to day one of a fantastic program. I'm going to start by setting the stage. The title of my brief remarks are Integrating Sex and Gender into Biomedical Research as a Path for Better Science and Innovation. And I need to begin by expressing appreciation for the many women and healthcare providers and essential workers who have been holding it down for all of us for this last past year. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly thrown us all for a loop and we're dedicated, we're, we're delighted to, uh, to be here today and I wanna begin my remarks by expressing our appreciation. I also wanna begin uh, by acknowledging Dr. Vivian Pinn and her legacy of leadership. This symposium is named for Dr. Vivian Pinn, the first full-time director of the Office of Research on Women's Health, an incredible trailblazer and pioneer and advocating for women's health and inclusion of women and underrepresented groups from the very beginning. We want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Penn for her amazing contributions, and you'll hear more about her and from her later today. As you know, the Office of Research on Women's Health, or ORWH mission, is threefold. We want to expand women's health research. We want to make sure that underrepresented groups are included as well as women, and we want to make sure that all women in STEM reach their full potential. As we imagine a world where sex and gender are integrated across the research continuum and every woman receives evidence-based treatment and care designed her for her own circumstances, needs, and goals. And to do that, we've worked with the 27 institutes and centers at NIH and our internal and external stakeholders to develop an NIH-wide strategic plan. And I like to say the ultimate goal of the strategic plan is the first goal, which is to advance rigorous research that is relevant to the health of women. Today we're talking about sex and gender, very important determinants and play a critical role in all of our health. So just to begin with some definitions, sex is a biological variable determined by chromosomal complement. Um, gender is a multi-dimensional social construct with multiple domains, including gendered roles, behaviors, expressions, gender dynamics, gender identity, and both matter in health and disease. Most recently, Dr. Londa Schiebinger and her colleagues put forward a new paper that talks about how to measure gender and puts forward gender as a social variable, complementary to sex as a biological variable. You'll hear from Dr. Schiebinger later. So I'll start now by talking about where we are and where we need to go. So here's the data. In the United States, we have shorter lives and poorer health than our peer countries. U.S. represented in pink here, women on the left, men on the right, life expectancy at birth. Over the past few years, our life expectancy at birth, at birth has been falling further and further behind our peer countries. And this paper looked at whether it was which age group uh, was which at which age that life expectancy was altered. For other countries, it was for illnesses over the age of 65. For the United States, this shortening of our life expectancy is related to diseases and conditions that occur before the age of 65. Drug overdoses and other chronic conditions were highlighted in this publication as causes. So I'm gonna set the stage and I try not to be a negative person. I am a quite optimistic person, but I do think we need to get straight to the point about what's going on today. First, we see that there's a combination of the fact that there's this default human model that's 70 kilogram man and a preponderant use of male animals in preclinical research that has resulted in this unidimensional way of looking at science. And that has created knowledge gaps. We just know less about female biology than we do about male biology. We see that in various diseases and how that plays out. But most recently, a new publication highlighted the fact that women actually have less access to the kidney transplant wait list in the current era. And black women have even less access to that wait list. We hear often in the media that women are not listened to or believed. When we report symptoms of pain or unusual or non-specific symptoms, um, many women are not believed, and we see that play out in the maternal morbidity and mortality crisis in our country. That can result in misdiagnoses and undertreatments. 
At an institutional level, we see that women's health is not taken as seriously. Uh, here's a recent publication that highlighted that papers on women's health, even though they were judged as rigorous as papers on men's health, were less likely to get accepted and cited. Yet we know that women make 80% of health-related decisions in society and our families. And we know that by improving women's health, especially with pregnant women's health, we can improve everyone's health over time. And in terms of our investments in women's health, uh, we see that they're not aligned with our proportion in the population, our central role as caregivers and decision makers, uh, or consistent with uh, some of our principles, equity principles in good science. Here's one example. So this data shows uh, funding related to specific diseases, some diseases affecting men more than women in blue, some diseases affecting women more than men in red. Uh, in this, on the x-axis, you see US dis disability adjusted life years. And what this paper did is they compared the level of funding to the disease burden as defined by disability adjusted life years. And for that black straight line represents a one-to-one -one correspondence between funding and disability, you know, dis disability adjusted life years. All of the dots that are above the line, and most of them are blue, represent uh, funding above the level expected, and they're mostly for diseases that affect more men than women. All the dots below the line, and they're mostly red, represents funding that was less than expected by the disease burden, and they're mostly red reflecting diseases that are more common in women than men. So we see a mismatch here. Recently, the Women's Health Access Matters Group, or WAM, has sought change by quantifying the economic benefit of women's health research. And I refer to the recent report uh, that they did in collaboration with the RAND Corporation. And they found that modest investments in women's health research played out with big impacts in terms of economic impacts and improvement of quality of life. In fact, they found a return on investment of 224% just for doubling investments in women's health research. The multidimensional framework uh, represents an intersection of factors that affect the health of women, and ORWH put this forward in the new uh, NIH-wide strategic plan. We have to consider a life course perspective uh, all the way from our childhood through our adulthood, the biological perspective or internal factors, in this case, first and foremost, sex affect our health, as well as external factors, be they social determinants of health, environmental exposures, or even policies. And these internal and external factors interact over time and across the life, life course to affect the health of women. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly uh, demonstrated that sex and gender matter. And we see this excess mortality rate in men. For every 10 women infected, there are 18 ICU admissions in men and 15 deaths in men. But what about looking at the intersection of sex, gender, race, and ethnicity and age? This study looked at um, COVID mortality rates, age-adjusted COVID mortality rates in Georgia and in Michigan. And what they found was that black women's COVID-19 mortality rates exceeded that of white men's, four times greater than white men's, three times greater than Asian men's, and higher than Asian and white women's in, in both Georgia and Michigan. So you can see that it's important to look at both sex, gender, race, and ethnicity to be able to have a more nuanced understanding of what's going on and to consider local and geographic environments. These disparities for COVID-19 mortality are replicating existing racial uh, and health inequities. And while men have a higher rate than women across in, in individual racial groups, we need to consider systemic and social factors to understand how this is playing out in society. The pandemic has disproportionately affected women, especially women scientists who are parents. We've seen, uh, especially faculty with small children, reporting fewer work hours. We've seen fewer papers being published by women first or senior authors. And we did our own survey of extramural researchers and research organizations and supported a National Academy's survey to look at the impact of COVID-19 on the workforce. And we're seeing important effects there. We also are observing a collision of crises where the maternal mortality crisis, um, which was pre-pandemic, 
Uh, women came into this pandemic already with higher maternal mortality rates in the United States than elsewhere. Women of color in particularly affected. Um, and we saw that we need to understand race as a social construct, not as a medical risk factor. That in and of itself, race is not the risk factor. This is an opportunity to tackle intransigent disparities in maternal health. So today, what we have is an opportunity through, here's a quote from Walt, Walter Scheidel. Throughout recorded history, the most dramatic and violent ruptures were also the most effective levelers of social and economic inequality. The collapse of states, the world wars, the great communist revolutions, the worst pandemics belong in the same category. So today we have an opportunity to get serious about studying sex and gender. The pandemic has exacerbated health disparities and health inequities. It has revealed ways that sex and gender influence the health of women. It has affirmed how much we do not know about conditions and diseases and how they affect women. It has reinforced that women deserve better. It has affirmed just how important women are to our families, our communities, our nation, our world. And it's shown that investing in women's health is the right thing and the smart thing to do. We do that by moving beyond inclusion and integrating sex and gender across the biomedical research continuum from preclinical to translational and clinical work and integrating sex and gender into our reporting, our education, and our policy. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Freire. Dr. Freire has been an active member of many international boards and committees, and she comes to us today as the President and Executive Director of the Foundation for NIH. She has received numerous awards and is um, serving on many committees, too many to list here, and I am delighted to have her here and to be her partner on this effort. You could say, like the famous line from the movie Casablanca, Maria, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship between ORWH and FNIH. It's my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Maria Frere. Uh, can you, thank you for this introduction. Uh, and thank you for setting, for setting the stage. This is uh, a truly important topic and something that we're all keenly interested. So good morning, everybody. I want to uh, extend my warm welcome along with Janine's to all of you who are joining us for the fifth annual Vivian Pinn Symposium. The FNIH is deeply honored to co-host this event with the NIH's Office of Research on Women's Health. As Janine says, Janine, this is the beginning of a great friendship. Now, I would like to especially thank the ORWH and the Steering Committee for convening such an impressive group of thought leaders, the kind of leaders who I know will roll up their sleeves and do impactful work to tackle some of the challenges that Janine just has put before us. And yes, of course, there's much work to be done. As the title of the symposium states, Integrating sex and gender into biomedical research is certainly a critical endeavor. Now, in an interesting confluence of thought, as the FNIH itself is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year, and I know, Janine, you celebrated your 30th anniversary, so we're, we're pretty much uh, came along at the same time. Well, our anniversary theme is Science Leads. And it parallels very nicely with the overarching message of this symposium, that science focused on women's health will result in better outcomes for everyone. Now, Science Leads has been the rallying cry of the woman we honor today, Dr. Vivian Pinn. Vivian is a force and an inspiration to us. She saw the issues related to women's health and their importance in the scientific and medical ecosystem way before many others did so. In fact, and if I have to be perfectly honest, it was not an understanding that came naturally to many. Now, I think that, in fact, may be an understatement. But Vivian knew that scientific research is near, neither fully accurate nor effective unless it considers the entire spectrum of possibility. 
Vivian recognized the challenges, and of course, she recognized the enormous untapped opportunity that would open before us once the basic biology resulting from sex differences would be understood. The catalytic importance of this understanding, as Janine just went through all the data, but the, the, the importance of understanding this for the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of disease cannot be underestimated, and it certainly cannot be overemphasized. It spans the gamut from Alzheimer's to heart disease to COVID, as we've just heard. Now, many of you know Dr. Pin's exceptional professional journey prior to becoming the first full-time director of the Office of Research of Women Health 30 years ago. Much of it was blazing trails and serving as role model for countless aspiring physicians and researchers, and she continues to do that today. But what many may not know is that, well, apart from my enormous admiration for her work and our personal friendship, Vivian and I share one interesting common root. We both graduated from the University of Virginia. In fact, I spent six years getting my PhD and my first postdoc at Jordan Hall, the most important medical research building on campus. So not too long ago, I was asked to come back and give a lecture at UVA. To my absolute delight and surprise, Jordan Hall is now Pin Hall in recognition of one of UVA's most distinguished alumni. Such a well-deserved honor for an amazing and classy woman. Vivian, I do not know how it feels like to have a whole building named after you, but what a well-deserved and wonderful honor. So yes, as Janine has put before us, there is much work that still needs to be done on women's health. But let us not forget where we came from and the enormous strides that have been made and upon which we continue to build. And a lot of them started with Vivian's vision. In the next two days, the vital explora exploration around integrating sex and gender into biomedical research promises to create new initiatives, build new partnerships, and establish a better framework for approaching scientific questions. Vivian, thank you for opening up the path that many continue to follow. We do so because women and men all over the world will be better for it, and the next two days will help in that pursuit. Now, as I finish, I would be remiss if I did not express my sincere appreciation to our gold sponsors, Hologic and Amgen, and to our silver sponsor, Myovent, and to all our sponsors that understand the critical nature of this topic and for making these two days possible. So thank you all very, very much. And Janine, I hand the baton back to you. Thank you, Dr. Frere, for those lovely remarks. And I, too, agree. Vivian is indeed a force. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Francis Collins. Dr. Collins' presence and participation here today are a tribute to the importance of women's health research, as well as to Dr. Penn and her tremendous contributions to improving women's health. As I said before, Dr. Collins is a giant among giants of biomedical research, both as a scientist and as a leader. Many of you know his historical background, but I'll highlight just a few. As a biomedical researcher, Dr. Collins made genetics his area of concentration and has um, noted for his groundbreaking discoveries of disease-causing genes and later, later his leadership of the Human Genome Project. The latter came to a spectacular conclusion in 2003 with the completion of the finished sequence of the human genome. Dr. Collins has received many awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the National Medical of Science, and he is also the 50th winner of the Templeton Prize, which celebrates scientific and spiritual curiosity. Under his leadership of NIH, there has been a substantial growth in the research of, on women's health uh, here at NIH, and from maternal health to breast cancer and cardiovascular disease, and even mental health. 
Dr. Collins has also been a champion of policies that have helped advance the health of women. And it's been my privilege and honor to partner with him in the development of the NIH policy on the sex, on sex as a biological variable, or we, as we call SABV. He's also been a champion for greater representation of women and underrepresented groups in the biomedical workforce. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure, my pleasure to introduce the 16th director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Francis S. Collins. Thank you, Janine. <laughs> And um, hello to everyone. Apologies that there might have been a slight bit of scary moment here in terms of uh, trying to get me uh, linked up uh, just for the last 30 seconds. It seems to have worked, although I'm not sure my um, image is coming through. I keep getting asked whether I will share my webcam, and the answer is yes. There. Hello. So, um, welcome everybody. <laughs> a slightly frantic arrival here on my part uh, to the fifth annual Vivian Penn Symposium. And uh, of course, a lot of teamwork involved in this in terms of the collaboration between ORWH and FNIH in organizing this. And of course, aiming for a high bar because the namesake. Dr. Vivian Penn, the first permanent NIH Associate Director for Research on Women's Health, uh, herself set a very high bar both for her career and for the way in which she led ORWH from its uh, initial stages. Uh, prior to coming to ORWH, uh, she was the first African-American woman to chair an academic pathology department in the U.S. And at NIH, Vivian worked tirelessly to improve inclusion and helped create a broader understanding of women's health, which moved beyond just a focus on the reproductive system to accompany, encompass every part of the body, right down to individual cells. And a lot has been happening about that. Uh, Vivian also established uh, the program Building Interdisciplinary Research Careers in Women's Health, or BIRCWH, which I've always pronounced Birch, and I hope that's not too far off. And it was my great privilege uh, to work with Vivian as a colleague since I've now been at NIH since, oh my gosh, 1993, and uh, to see the way in which her leadership helped propel the study of sex and gender in biomedical research. So we gather here for these two days uh, to reflect on how far we have come and also how far we still need to go. I think it's fair to say that the increased inclusion of sex and gender in biomedicine uh, promises to reap many rewards in terms of public health and medical care. I would like to reflect for a minute, for instance, on the program All of Us, uh, the largest effort that NIH has mounted in a very long time uh, to recruit a diverse cohort of individuals uh, aiming for 1 million participants. By the time recruitment is completed, we're up right now to about 300,000. And this is to identify by asking these individuals to serve as our partners, uh, sharing lots of information about themselves uh, and sharing their electronic health records, uh, providing blood samples uh, for various measurements, including complete DNA sequencing. And this will be the most diverse cohort that we've ever tried to mount, uh, slightly over 50% individuals of racial and ethnic minorities, and of course, uh, with a heavy emphasis on a good balance of sex and gender. Uh, that is already coming along in a pretty exciting way. If I was gonna pick something most recently that perhaps reflects the way in which a focus on sex and gender is turning up with observations that people might not have expected, uh, I wanna point to the common fund project called GTEx, which stands for Genotype Tissue Expression basically looking at the level of RNA expressed in a variety of tissues, uh, 44 of them, uh, in almost a thousand individuals done at rapid autopsy, and asking the question, okay, which tissues express which genes? That tells you a lot about development and about normal physiology, but which of those differ between men and women? If your idea was you would only find those differences in the reproductive system, well, think again. 13,000 genes are expressed differently between the sexes. That's a significant fraction of the total. And that uh, relates to over 50 bodily traits and functions. Uh, very exciting uh, finding there that tells us a lot that we didn't know uh, about uh, the way in which uh, sex and gender affect 
um, physiological and genetic uh, contribution. So much more to come. Uh, traditionally, as we all know, uh, research had tended to focus on male subjects. And while we made a lot of progress on that, uh, going back to the Women's Health Initiative and the efforts inspired by members of Congress and by leadership of NIH, uh, like Dr. Pin and Dr. Healy is the person that hired me to come uh, to NIH in 1993. Um, but it wasn't complete uh, in the degree that you would like, and we particularly were concerned, uh, Janine Clayton and I were, uh, that it did not seem that this notion of inclusion of both sexes was necessarily being applied in other studies like animal research. And so uh, we developed five years ago uh, what is uh, affectionately, I hope, called the SABV, uh, Sex is a Biological Variable uh, Program, and insisted that NIH grantees, as they approach problems, needed to consider this as a high priority uh, for the research they were doing so that we would not miss the fact that differences do occur uh, between the sexes. Um, we can see uh, positive effects on that as the first uh, round of grants that were brought forward under this policy are now starting to publish their findings. And I've heard many stories from researchers who were initially a little skeptical and maybe even a little bit worried that this was gonna put an additional burden on them in terms of how they designed their studies. They are waking up uh, to the fact that they're now beginning to make discoveries about sex differences that were missed all along. So uh, I think that has been a very significant step forward and much credit uh, to Dr. Clayton for having the vision. And I was delighted to work with her on that to get this out there and to get the community uh, to see the value of it and to embrace it. So um, ORWH, um, not only uh, playing that role, but also funding some of this research and helping train the next generation. COVID-19 pandemic has, of course, in, involved all of us in ways we didn't expect for the last 16 months. So I can't come to this particular discussion without mentioning that. It has been a consuming passion uh, for me. I'm talking to you from my home office where I've kind of been a hermit uh, for the last year uh, trying to manage the NIH uh, leadership role <clears throat> in this way. And it's been amazing how people have rolled up their sleeves and come forward uh, with all kinds of creative ideas and willingness to work prodigiously hard uh, to try advance our efforts in diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. And we have made great progress there. I should mention, though, that we've also, in the area of understanding sex differences, been able to appreciate and even begin to understand a little bit uh, that there are uh, differences in terms of how COVID-19 has affected individuals. Uh, certainly when it comes to the severe form uh, of COVID-19, it seems that men and women are roughly equally affected, but the men have a higher likelihood of the most severe form and, the form and leading on to death. And that is potentially uh, something that we could understand a bit on the basis of comorbidities, but not entirely. We are also very troubled now about noting that there is, for this respiratory virus, not only the threat of severe acute illness, which has sadly taken the lives already of 580,000 people in the United States, but there is this long tail of uh, consequences where somewhere between 10% and maybe as many as 30% of individuals do not come back to normal functioning after a couple of weeks, the way you would expect for other respiratory viruses. Now, some of those are people who are in the ICU and perhaps even on a ventilator, and we know post-ICU syndrome can linger a long time, but some of these are people who are not as sick as that, maybe not even hospitalized, and yet who weeks or months afterwards are still suffering from fatigue, shortness of breath, palpitations, brain fog, making it hard for them to do uh, hard work that requires concentration. We have named this PASC, or post-acute sequelae of COVID-19, but most of the world is calling it long COVID, and that's a fine description as well. And we at NIH, thanks to additional funds from the Congress, are now invested in trying to understand this by creating and following a meta-cohort 
of the tens of thousands of individuals who are COVID survivors to try to understand what are the factors that lead to this? What's the mechanism where these symptoms persist? Is there somewhere a reservoir of virus that hasn't been cleared? Is this the immune system that has gone out of whack and has not come back to where it should be? Is this a metabolic issue? Is this a blood clotting issue? Uh, we don't really have good answers and we aim to find them out. But it is certainly the case when you look at the epidemiology that women are more likely than men uh, to suffer from long COVID. That's another clue that we need to try to understand and get our heads around. We just had uh, a week ago, a very intense many hour hearing in front of the House Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee about long COVID with 50 members of Congress asking probing questions, expressing their concern about this and giving NIH the, the mandate and trusting us uh, to come up with answers to try to sort this out. So this is gonna be a big fo focus. One more surprise and not a happy one that COVID-19 has brought us, but we as the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world are determined to take that on. So NIH called upon in that space, uh, certainly with diagnostics, uh, we've worked really hard to come up with new platforms to make it possible for people to find out if they have the virus, including home testing, which is currently undergoing a pilot in North Carolina and in Tennessee uh, that is going to teach us whether this is a way in which we can reduce transmission and give people the ability in their own hands uh, to be able to find out whether they're carrying the virus. And I would uh, suspect from many other things that we've known that it often be women in the household who figure out how to make the most of that kind of opportunity. So I guess um, just to conclude my brief remarks here, I'm really glad we're going to have this opportunity at this uh, symposium, the fifth annual uh, Viv and Penn Symposium, uh, to contemplate uh, the areas where sex and gender are critical in biomedical research for COVID-19 and of course for many other things as well. And I wish you all the best as you take the time here, virtual though it is, to hear presentations and to engage in panel discussions, figure out what more we should be doing that we haven't thought of yet. Uh, we want to be as creative as possible in tackling uh, this very important mandate that we have. So with that, I am going to say thank you uh, for the chance uh, to say these few remarks and then move into my opportunity uh, to introduce the next presenter, who I understand will be coming to you uh, by video in a moment. And that is a member of Congress, Representative Madeline Dean uh, from Pennsylvania. Um, and Madeline Dean is a mother, a grandmother, an attorney, a professor, and a former four-term member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, now currently in her second term in the U.S. Congress, where she represents the fourth district of Pennsylvania. That would be Berks and Montgomery counties, if you know Pennsylvania. She serves on the Financial Services Committee, the Steering and Policy Committee. She's vice chair of the Judiciary Committee. And particularly appropriate for today's discussion, she is co-chair of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. She has championed progressive priorities like public education, combating addiction, equal rights, access to health care, protecting the environment, ethics, criminal justice reform, stopping gun violence, and more. She's been a very busy person. And so it is a real pleasure to be able to introduce her and to give her the opportunity to speak uh, to all of you from her perspective uh, as a member of Congress about this issue of integrating sex and gender into biomedical research as a path for better science and innovation. Congresswoman Dean. of the Symposium, the Office of Research on Women's Health, and the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health, for asking me to participate and offer keynote remarks for this, the fifth annual Vivian Pinn Symposium. Thank you to Dr. Janine Clayton and Dr. Frances Collins for your leadership, especially this past year. And I especially thank Dr. Vivian Pinn for all your work to improve health and career opportunities for women and minorities, and particularly for the work you have done to ensure that federally funded medical studies include female patients. It is my pleasure to be here 
and highlight the importance of supporting research that advances science and research for the health of women, especially during National Women's Health Week. We know the past year has been like, unlike any other and has highlighted the many disparities we see in women's health. To have equitable representation, we need women and minorities in every field and at every table. In healthcare especially, representation matters for trust and quality of care. I am a co-chair of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. It is a priority of ours to address the needs of women and families. Examining sex and gender in biomedical research is necessary to understand the numerous ways sex and gender can affect and influence health outcomes. In the past decade, we know there have been improvements to include sex as a biological variable, variable, but we know more needs to be done. The pandemic has demonstrated the need for accurate research that looks at sex as a biological variable. For example, data suggests there are stark disparities based on sex regarding the effects of COVID-19. COVID-19 appears to be infecting similar numbers of women and men, but men tend to face higher mortality rates and women seem to seem more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19 long haulers. Patients who face serious long-term side effects following the initial infection. One study suggests women outnumber men four to one within the long hauler population. With increased information as to the adverse effects of long haulers, women have reported feeling hesitant to talk to their healthcare providers due to a fear of being dismissed. COVID-19 has only exacerbated health impacts on a female population that already faces stigma and unique challenges navigating the healthcare system. With all of this, COVID has economically affected women, especially women of color, more so than other populations. Recent reports have announced that 25% of women say they are fiscally worse off a year into the pandemic compared with 18% of men. We know women make up the majority of essential workers in service industries and elsewhere, and also tend to do much of the unpaid caregiving and domestic work. Women are disproportionately dealing with the impacts of worsening mental health, and women, especially women of color, are more likely than men to live in poverty, placing them at increased risk for food insecurity. If we can use sex and gender in research, we can better understand how COVID-19 will impact not only health outcomes, but economic and social outcomes as well. Highlighting sex and gender in biomedical research may provide us with better predictive tools to understand how future diseases or future infections will impact women. To help with this issue, I was pleased to lead an appropriations letter alongside my co-chair of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus, Congresswoman Jennifer Gonzalez Colon, along with our vice chair, Congresswoman Lucy McBath, that requests language to highlight the importance of studying how sex as a biological variable can impact short and long-term health, health effects due to infections with COVID-19. Research into sex as a biological variable can impact beyond COVID-19. It can lead to greater understanding of health outcomes for women's health with regard to maternal health, mental health, and addiction. This research can be transformative for women of all backgrounds and all health issues or crises. Thank you again for inviting me to provide remarks for this very important symposium. I am excited for the conversations and discussions you all will have and hear the ways we can continue to improve and address barriers that currently exist in our research. Again, thank you for the honor of being invited to speak with you. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Madeline Dean. We are so thrilled to be able to include you in our program today. And as you said, women belong in every field and at every table. And you mentioned how transformative research can be to improving the lives of all women. So we certainly appreciate you being with us today. Next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Jamie White, ORWH's Health Science Strategy and Relations Lead. 
uh, to kick us off with some introductory um, in instructions and, and housekeeping items. Jamie? I thank you, Dr. Clayton. I appreciate that. I would like to thank all of the sponsors for this meeting, but also want to thank FNIH for their partnership in this. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Clayton for the, the wonderful end of the introduction and also setting the stage for this. So we can go to the next slide by any chance. So while we're here, the objective for this meeting is to illustrate the scientific, societal, and economic opportunities of integrating sex and gender into the biomedical research and the power of us synergistically doing this together. The goals are creating bridges and capacity to uh, work bi-directionally across silos, because we unfortunately are in silos within the scientific uh, enterprise and to build a resilient interconnected network, which I hope that we've done today. Um, this will include federal and private um, funders of research, industry and business, journal editors and publishers, um, professional societies, scientific and health organizations, health career, um, healthcare providers, researchers, academic institutions, policymakers, and also the public. We hope to develop strategies with the help of you um, to achieve the integration of sex and gender considerations throughout the biomedical research um, enterprise. And lastly, we hope to characterize issues related to health, the health of women while exploring women's health research priorities and public health opportunities. For a multidimensional perspective to advance the integration of sex and gender considerations via transdisciplinary cross-sector approaches and partnerships. So I just wanna do a quick overview of um, what's to come. So we hit the next slide. So in advance, um, I wanna again thank Dr. Clayton for setting the stage, Dr. Um, Fryer for opening remarks, and also Dr. Collins for opening remarks in our keynote address. Um, we will have a panel right after this and the um, called Teach One, Reach One, Academia's Roll Call, and that will actually still be in the auditorium. Then you guys will have a break, you get to eat. Um, then after that, we will have another panel that will be hosted back in the auditorium um, called Moving Beyond Inclusion to Innovation, the Scientific Opportunity, and there will be um, one more panel uh, before you have a small break, which is the life cycle of communicating the science. After the break, um, we will ask you all to go to the breakout rooms. And in case you haven't or are not familiar, if you look at the bottom of your um, uh, of the scroll bar, there's a place that says breakout rooms. Please go there and or if you go to the lobby, that's also on the screen in there. And if you have any troubles with navigation, please look at the navigation um, video because that will also give you information to help you all to navigate throughout the different parts of the environment. After the breakout sessions, then we will have our last panel, panel of the day, uh, which we back by public demand. And then I'll do a wrap up and closing and then that will allow you guys to have a small break. And then we will ask you all to join us for the evening fireside chat with Dr. Penn and America's Dr. Dr. Fauci. That will actually be hosted in the network lounge where you also have the opportunity to chat. But lastly, um, there will be a live Q&A with me and Dr. Um, Dr. Penn, so please stay tuned in that. And so for the next day, just quickly, next slide, sorry. The next day you'll see me again, I'll be doing a welcoming recap of today. Um, then there will be a panel for government agencies call to action. We'll be doing another panel called Putting Skin in the Game, the Economic Opportunity. And then there will be a lunch break. After the break for 45 minutes, we'll join back here. Again, all of these, um, all the panels will be hosted in the auditorium. So I just want to reflect that and make sure everyone knows that. And that will be the Society's Promise for Improved Science Culture, the Scientific Opportunity. And then we will have you guys join us back into the breakout rooms for our breakout session two that's entitled The Scientific um, Enterprise. The last panel of the day will be creating synergistic partnerships to power of working together, one of our themes and one of the major parts of um, why we're here. We'll, after that, we'll have a small break and then there will be report out so you can actually hear and learn what happened in the other breakout sessions. I wanna just reflect that for the breakouts we're asking for the first day that you please join based on the affiliation that you are as far as your job or career. Um, and then for the second day, whatever, Close your boat, whatever you feel that you want to join into and hear and listen into, please feel free to join that web webinar or that link um, on the next day. So if you have any questions, obviously please go throughout the help desk because that is also there to help anyone that needs anything. And um, on that note, I'm going to turn it back over. Um, again, enjoy the meeting. I hope you all enjoy it. I hope you guys get the returns to And I'm grateful that you all are here. So with that, I'm going to end and say thanks.